The thing you need to know about business is your business is not your baby, mm. right? And so many people are like, well, you know how I feel, like my business is my baby. And there are a host of reasons why your business should not be your baby. But let's start with the fact that you carry a baby, especially if you're a mom. <laughs> it's a very intimate thing. You are, uh, it, it's in your womb. It's well, a part yeah. of you, right? Like you give it life. Yes, you take an idea and you give the idea life, but literally nothing happens if the business idea doesn't work. Hey guys, welcome back to The Push Podcast. I'm Janelle Copeland. And I'm Edward Copeland. Who? Edward Copeland. <laughs> Sorry, I'm so used to doing something crazy. Oh my gosh. Okay, well, this is episode number 127. Um, shout out to you for getting to 127. Shout out to you too. Um, that's a really big accomplishment though, because you told me the other day that 1% of people um, only in, get past the 100th episode. 1% uh, of people get, 1% of podcasts get over 100,000 downloads and we are over that. So shout out to everyone. Shout um, out to us. Who if supports the Push Podcast. Yep. Please tell a friend, tell a family member, tell a stranger, tell your enemy to listen to the wow. Push Podcast. Yeah, that's what we tell want. Tell your enemy to up level. Uh, yeah, because well, that's the only way you're going to make things right. Here's the thing. <laughs> this episode is going to be episode one of a three-part series. And I guarantee this is an episode series that you're going to want to share the Push Podcast with lots of people that you know. And the reason for that is because we wanna to talk to you about transformations, and we're gonna do a transformation series on your body and your health in the upcoming um, episodes to come. But this particular transformation series is gonna be about how to transform your business. Yeah, so this is like specifically for our business owners, entrepreneurs, wannabe entrepreneurs, like people who are in the thick of it, I think that this is going to be a series of episodes that I think you're going to enjoy and you're going to get a lot out of. Right. And so let's clarify what kind of business owners. Obviously, I used to own a bakery. I've owned a meal prep company. I feel like I've, I own Copeland Inc. Um, so we have knowledge on lots of different businesses, but a lot of my kind of recommendations are going to be from my experience, right? We right. also have a corporate background, but we have a lot of friends that own, your brother owns a barbecue company, like mm -hmm. a food truck, right? We have friends who own hair salons or flower shops or um, who are barbers, who are woodworkers, who are welders. And so we really love being in connection. Home dealerships. Uh, car dealerships, yeah. restaurants, right? right? So I think that the information we're going to give you is designed for you to be able to take in information that you need, but also share with someone. If you know someone who's got an idea that they've been wanting to turn into a business and they don't know where to start, please share this. Um, if you know someone who's been in business for a couple of years, but they're kind of not a lot of fun to be around or they can't ever come up for air and go out for a friend night out because they're always busy kind of being tied up right. in their business. This is the episode that you're going to want to share with them. So without further ado, we're going to dive into some of the steps and teachings that we want to share with you on how you can transform your business or take your business idea um, and turn it into a viable business. Yeah. I'm, Ready? I'm excited. Let's get going. Okay. So <laughs> step number one. Um, on how to transform your business is something we talk about often. Um, that is a lot of like mindset work and right. I know you're gonna wanna get into it. But the thing you need to know about business is your business is not your baby, mm. right? And so many people are like, well, you know how I feel, like my business is my baby. And there are a host of reasons why your business should not be your baby. But let's start with the fact that you carry a baby, especially if you're a mom. <laughs> it's a very intimate thing. You are, uh, it, it's in your womb. It's well, a part yeah. of you, right? Like it, you give it life. Yes, you take an idea and you give the idea life, but literally nothing happens if the business idea doesn't work, right? Yeah, and I think it's very easy and we definitely can see how maybe you've uttered those words before because yeah, a business is something you create. You technically create a baby, mm -hmm. right? And so <laughs> you think you think of it as something that is yours, that it is your creation and we so we get that and we want you to have a high sense of ownership. But the difference is, is that, and we'll go through this and why you have to separate that because the deeper meaning behind treating your business like your baby 
that impacts how you approach your business, how you make decisions and everything. So like, yes, you give, you create your business. Uh, it is a living operation. Uh, however, over time, hopefully your business doesn't need you. A baby will always need you. Right. And we want to build businesses that don't necessarily suck the life out of us, right? <laughs> All I can think about is like, I kind of giving you a kid analogy, your business does go through stages like a kid goes through. It has yeah. an infancy, right? That's the new idea, the new concept where you're just figuring out how to be a parent, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got like the toddler stages where everything's going wrong and you can't be in enough places to kind of watch what this kid is doing. Right. It gets into trouble and it can be detrimental. You might wind up in the ER. Um, and then it gets into like adolescence where it's maybe like, rebelling or has hit a lull or you don't necessarily like it as much as you right, used to like it. Right. So although there's a lot of fun analogies that we can use around your business being like your child, there's a lot more reasons why you should not use that analogy because you wind up putting so much of like your emotional energy into this thing that literally probably has a chance of not working. So let me give right. you some quick statistics and then we can start with well, the can, list. And I'll just add, yeah. add this too, too. And if you're thinking to yourself, oh, I don't treat my business like a baby or I don't intend on treating like a baby, maybe you treat it like this precious treasure that's untouched that mm -hmm. you want to be perfect before like you no one give else it can to, do it but before you before you give it to the world and so you fail to actually ship you fail to launch this this business you fail to do the thing that you've been wanting to do to create something because of the fact that you're treating it like this precious thing that you don't want to share with the world until right. it's ready and that's another version of treating this like your baby. Or what do you do when you love something so much you hoard it for yourself? I'm not gonna share my recipes in my baking business because no one can do it like I can. Yeah. No one can change this kid's diaper like I can, right? right. Where does that get you? That gets you to burnout. That right. gets you Overworked. to resentment. That gets you to be overwhelmed. And so often we see business owners treat their business like their baby and wind up in that place of frustration. And so that's what we're talking about. Some quick stats though 63 out of every 100 people say that they have an idea that's worthy of starting a business however only 55 percent of those 63 actually believe that they're even capable of starting the business mm. but here's the kicker only 12 out of the 100 will ever even try mm. okay after that though two thirds of the 12 won't even survive past the first two years. Mm -hmm. And then 50% of the 12 that tried, so six of them, their business will only survive the first five years. And only two people will actually survive out of the original 12 will actually survive to 10 years. Okay. Can you, so the reason why you can't think of your business as a baby is because there is a high mortality rate mm. on starting a business. There's not necessarily a high mortality rate on keeping your child alive. And can we just clarify th the context of those statistics is to give you an understanding that like this is something that is you, risky. It's risky. But at the same time, on the flip side of that, like let's say you do make it to five years or you do make mm -hmm. it to 10 years. Ultimately, the goal should be to possibly sell this business, mm -hmm. right? Uh, and so you don't sell your children. And so, <laughs> That's I mean, terrible. And it, but the, the attachment that people have, the emotional attachment that people have to the business is why some of those numbers are where they're at. Yeah. And then the fear factor of, you know, whether it be perfectionism or all the different things that kind of get in the way is also the reason why people don't try so if right. only 12% are willing to take the risk mm -hmm. like that tells you how like people second guess like everybody like right now who are listening to this podcast you all have an idea right right there's a chosen few who decide to choose in themselves to believe themselves to actually do something with that idea mm -hmm. and so hopefully after going through what we're going to talk about in this series if it's not a transformation maybe it is a is an activation right. for you to get going so instead of being emotionally attached to your baby, right. we, we want you to understand your job as a business owner is to actually get your customers 
to be emotionally attached to your brand. Yeah. And so being emotionally attached is like when I owned the Cake Mamas, I couldn't walk through Costco. I still can't walk through Costco now without someone saying, Cake Mama, I love your cupcakes. And so getting them to be emotionally invested to where they're willing to yell down the aisle and tell you how much they love your brand, that's the emotional investment or attention that we're looking for from the customer, not necessarily from you. Yeah, like the deep, deep, disappointment you have when you think that you want a chick-fil-a sandwich and it's sunday <laughs> that yeah, is the emotional investment build a business like that yeah <laughs> where you're like dang which it's means sunday. an amazing product that people right. rave about that crave they crave right <laughs> right okay so let's dive into some more reasons why your business is not your baby and number one i will just tell you it blinds you from some of the glaring problems that are happening in your business yeah. maybe you have a business that is not making money but you know money or numbers are not really your strong suit so you're just like ah, i'm not gonna look at that um but this is so much fun you know i would do this for free even if i didn't make any money because i really love it and i'm super talented and so you're blinded by the passion that you have or the feelings that you have to where you're kind of avoiding some of the big glaring issues yeah and i think that is what makes you an emotional leader right and so Anytime you have an idea and you are trying to create a business, you are now kind of indoctrinating yourself into the world of leadership. And the key is, is that it's okay to be an emotional leader, but you don't want to be emotionally driven, right? right? And so you want, like children will make you emotionally driven, right? And mm. even the, the, the best parents try to do the very best they can, mm -hmm. but they fall into the trap of trying to keep, keep, make sure their kid avoids pain. Right. Right. And so then all of a sudden your kid doesn't have certain learnings. Well, you don't want to have that type of relationship with your business. You want to make sure that you're approaching your business in a way that is emotional because you're passionate. You wanted to do well. But at the same time, you're not all over the place. Right. And your business is going to go through obstacle after obstacle and if you're emotional it's gonna be really tough yeah. to um, lead that lead that entire business I love that um, number two it can hurt your decision making right just like you can make some really bad decisions like we are watching power right now I'm not sure if you guys watch that show legitimately we're like should we be drug lords maybe this is our calling um, you do a lot of crazy things for your your kids you want right. to shield them from going to jail you want to cover things for them right like you said and in the previous point is it just it's bad decision quality when you love something and you're emotionally invested in it so much so um, it can hurt some of your decision making and in business in doing business decision making can be hard yeah. you know you've got to make really tough decisions like i really want to buy this expensive packaging or invest in this process or take this class or whatever it may be but it might not be the best time for us to do that financially i yeah, really want right. to hire more people but i'm afraid to share my recipes with them or i'm afraid that they'll mess it up so not going to do that right now i'll hoard it right yeah. so your decision making can be really foggy if you're too emotionally invested yeah and i think that you start a business a lot of times because you, you maybe you've done something creative and you created something that people love right and so you decide to make a business off of that and then you get into the business and then you find out through your customers there's a deeper need but because of the fact you're so emotionally tied to what you started the business with, mm -hmm. you can't adjust and adapt to what your customers are asking for. Yep. And so you, you, you're you holding on, you have this attachment to, I wanna do this, this is what I'm passionate about, but you're forgetting, like if you wanna pursue a passion, that's fine, you can have a hobby, but when you turn into a business, you're responding to the market. You're now serving customers. Right, the market who are AKA the customer will dictate what you should be doing because you wanna make sure you're fulfilling a need. Right. right, and I can't tell you how many of our students in Passion of Profit will come to us and they want to grow their business, and you know we talk to them and we're like, okay, well, what are you, what do you make? Oh, we've been making cinnamon rolls for thirty years, and you know we're just trying to figure out a way to increase sales. Okay, well, how could we innovate around that? Ah, we don't, people don't want food coloring. I don't want to waste my time with that, so they won't innovate around this product, right? Or you open, we've seen uh, a Mexican bakery open in our neighborhood. 
good, but there are not, there's not a huge Hispanic clientele. So you want to sell this product, but you're not using good decision quality to say like, okay, do the customers in this neighborhood really want this, right? right? Is this the best product to serve them? And so it just puts you in a situation where you again have this deep attachment to these beliefs or these things that you love. But like Eddie said, when you turn it into a business, your job is not to make the stuff that you're good at, the stuff that you like, the stuff that your grandmother taught you. Your job is to serve a community that in turn will pay you for a service or a product that they love that they want to tell everybody about. Yeah, and I think that the the other piece of that is if you if you deeply love something that you're saying, hey, I do this better than anyone else, and then there's also something else that you do that customers really love, then it's up to you to find a way to say, okay, I'm going to use what they love to introduce them mm-hmm. to something they may not know anything about. So if this is, let's just say, the Mexican bakery you're talking about, like if they made something that a lot of people love, right? right they have an opportunity to introduce Put a spin people. On it to things that are that may be really more authentic that they've never heard of before but you can't do that if you're so attached to like oh i'm only going to post the things i love and i'm going to make people love this even though you're not giving them a way to get introduced to it right i love that um the next step or next tip that we have for you on why your business is not your baby is you'll never create an exit strategy you kind of touched on this a second ago which was like you're not going to sell your kids right. but people sell businesses all the time If I had a dollar for every time I taught a class or spoke in front of an audience and people said, because I ask all the time, why do you want to start the business? Oh, I want to leave something to my kids. I'm just going to tell you, I've said it before, your kids don't want your shitty ass business. They don't want your successful ass business. They need to be able to find their own path, to find their own passions. So you can't build a business just to be able to hand it off to your kids. It's very, very rare that someone in your family is going to want to do exactly what you did, especially if you're tired, overworked, right. constantly complaining, never able to have fun, you yeah, have like, no joy in no your life. <laughs> they're like, I don't want that. You could keep that, right? I wouldn't pay for that. I wouldn't wish that I wouldn't, my Yeah. <laughs> so it's really important that you understand that um, creating a business around something you're passionate about today you, I'm just gonna tell you fast forward, it's a temporary season and it's likely that you'll outgrow it 10 or 15 years from now. So you've gotta create something that's got systems and processes and strategies in place with employees and help to be able to allow you to step away and to be able to give it to someone or sell it to someone long-term when you decide that the day comes that you just don't wanna do that anymore. Yeah. and. Th- in big businesses are not immune to this. And, I, and so I wanna make sure I connect it to things that you've probably seen before. But times change, the world changes, technology changes, and all of a sudden, whatever the, the product, whatever the service that you're providing may get outdated, mm-hmm. right? And staying in business for way too long could be devastating, right? And if you are finding it very hard for you to adjust and adapt to what's new, then like that is the tough thing and so you you have to make sure that you understand that like kodak used to be the biggest thing on the planet at one point Mm -hmm. right and then all of a sudden digital cameras came out Mm -hmm. right and then they put them away blockbuster was the biggest ticket in town if you wanted to rent movies but they couldn't adjust fast enough and netflix took them out Right. right and so there's always going to be something that you have to evolve and when you're thinking and you're emotionally attached to your business and you may not be thinking about okay I'm in a business that's no longer needed anymore, mm-hmm. right? Like if you are in a business right now of making car or uh, uh, installing calls st- car stereos, <laughs> I don't know how you're going to stay in business in the right. next 10 years when every car comes with a great sound system. Comes with a great sound system. It a, has a full LCD display, mm-hmm. like all those things that you can't like you're still working on cars in, from the 90s. Right. So you may have to adapt, you may have to adjust. Doesn't mean you have to get out of the car audio business, but maybe you your customer needs to change. Maybe it's it's like, "Hey, how do I, you know, work for a company like you know, I don't know, Tesla Tesla or something and say, hey, I I have a a skill set that help your sound system get even better, whatever the case may be. But you have to be able to evolve and you can't do that if you're you're too attached. Love that. Okay, tip number four. 
you won't allow others to run or help manage um, or just do anything in your business, mm -hmm. which is ultimately stunting the growth potential for your business. And this I see in creative industries so often, particularly the baking industry or the restaurant industry where people are actually creating something and it's something you worked really hard for and you worked on and you have perfected it, but now you think because you've perfected it, you're the only one that can, you know, produce it right and it just stifles your growth and the potential for growth for your business because you're the only maker of the thing right and so you know that really gets in the way but i think that comes from that emotional attachment of well this is my baby and this is my hard work and i'm not willing to share it because someone might steal it <laughs> and that's scarcity right yeah um yeah. one of our favorite restaurants is called pacific diner it's in san pedro we've been going there for 25 years they have the best waffles the best breakfast steak bits and eggs tell them janelle sent you um i asked the owner one time like you know good thing you don't have like competition like you guys have always just kind of cornered the market and he goes we don't have competition and he points across his parking lot the parking lot that he basically shares with the next you know business over and all these years i never noticed that it was also a breakfast cafe right and he said you know my first cook that i ever had that helped me develop all these recipes he left my business bought that property right there we shared the same parking lot and he opened a breakfast place literally i could throw a rock at it right that's how shady that partnership was i don't think it was a partnership but his cook left to go compete with him he goes we've been here 35 40 years i can't say the same for him mm. And so you get so worried about someone ripping you off. I've seen it happen many times, but I right. used to this in my bakery with my recipes. I'm like, good luck, like going through all the 2,700 steps that it took me to get to before I opened my brick and mortar. Good luck becoming a leader. Good right. luck with uh, managing your time. Good luck with a million other things if you think you're going to compete with me it's a long road ahead and yeah. so almost like kudos to you if you think you can do this um but i'm not going to let that stop me from hiring help or for from not overworking myself yeah it's interesting because like everyone wants to grow their business right if anyone who has a business that the ultimate the ultimate goal is to continue to grow it well the i the your ideas will not be the only ideas to grow it as a matter of fact if it's just your ideas more, more than likely you're going to stunt yourself right. and before you know it you're not going to have the growth you want so you're hiring people for diversity of thought and and thinking and everything that they do is going to help with innovation of creating something new in your business because some of the best ideas um like even today we were talking to our team some yeah. of the best ideas come from your brainstorming team, right you brainstorm you you collect with other people and because they see different things they have different experience and experiences than you do that gives you an opportunity but if you're overly cautious with your business because you're trying to protect this thing that you created you're you you have no idea it's just this is the one example that's just like a baby mm -hmm. right if you call to your baby you if you over overly cautious you don't let your, your kid do things that you know kids should do like take risks you know you know do things that will scare them just a little bit you will not find that they will be able to overcome like you'll be guarding them from things that will help them grow at a rapid rate yeah right and it's just like your business i love it and then like you have to remember that as a business owner your role is constantly changing mm. when i first started the business it was because i loved art i loved making i loved working with my hands i loved doing all that stuff well in order to grow the business, I needed to focus on you need marketing, a new job. right? I needed to give myself a new job in right. my business. So I needed to learn about marketing. And as I was learning about marketing and interacting with more customers and really leaning into customer service, then I needed to replace the being the doer, right? Mm -hmm. As I learned how to bring more customers into the business, I needed to now become the leader um, who was also the HR department, who was also out recruiting trying to find talent focusing on talent acquisition so I could hire more people to replace those last two roles that I did right and so you have to know that as a business owner your roles constantly changing but if you start it again as though you're the only one that can do these things you're setting yourself up for massive frustration yeah
for sure. Moving on to the next thing. Um, if you think that your business is your baby and it becomes the biggest priority in your life, um, feedback is always going to feel personal. Yeah. This is a big one. <laughs> yeah, it's just like someone calling your kid out of your name. Right. Like it feels super personal. but And you'll know that this right. is an issue for you if you hate Yelp. Right. Anytime I do a training, I'm like, so how do you feel about Yelp? And people in the food industry want to literally bomb the Yelp headquarters. Yeah. And it, and it, it's one thing when you take it personal, because then you think you think that they're attacking you. And mm -hmm. so your first instinct is to be defensive. So if you find that you get a review or someone leaves a comment on social media and you are defensive, that means you're taking it personal. And then you're also blocking the ability to actually see is there truth in what they're telling you because in a business you need feedback yep. you need because you're so close to it there are things that you don't notice and if you don't adhere to the feedback then what ends up happening is that you can't make the changes that are necessary to continue to grow to meet your customers where they would like to be met yeah and so lastly is number six is you can't negotiate with your baby Mm. But you have to negotiate <laughs> about your business, right? And, you, and not just negotiate with other business owners, but you have to negotiate your time. You have to negotiate, uh, you, you know, like what you're going to do with your business, all the different things you're constantly negotiating with the baby. The baby has needs. You got to fulfill them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right? So you can't negotiate, meaning like you can't weigh a ton of options with a child. You've got to just give it what it needs right then. Right. And I think it just kind of sucks you into like, what is the business asking for of me right now? Well, mm -hmm. right now I'm putting out a fire of a customer complaint. Right now I'm focusing on the crying that's coming from over here because I have an angry employee. Right now I have this issue, the baby's crying over here because, um, you know, I have a terrible vendor that I'm working with or I didn't get this opportunity that I was hoping for. So I think you can't negotiate when a baby needs you. When it right. needs you, it needs you. But you're saying in a business, like we have to be creating boundaries so yeah. that I'm not, you know, going and running to the baby every single time something happens and I'm putting out fires all day. Yeah. And, That's how I'm processing it. And then just to add that to, to my context, like, we talk about work-life integration, right? And so you're negotiating your boundaries mm -hmm. with the time that you're going to spend on this business, the money you're going to spend with this business, right? Um, the relationships you'll leverage with to, in order to get this business off the ground. And so you're constantly making adjustments and, and negotiating what, what you're going to do and what you're not going to do. Because like at the end of the day, you don't want to lose your life right. for this business. And what I you mean by lose not. your life is like the relationships that you have, like not being able to spend time with your kids, uh, like all those different things. And we know business can be something that you want to obsess about because you want it to be successful, mm -hmm. but you have to build in uh, during you know this time of building a business, you have to build in boundaries. And yes, there are going to be times where it's like, hey, this is grind season for mm -hmm. the next 90 days, right? And we just got to get after it. And so certain things are going to be put on pause. And then you have to say, okay, now I have it to a place where I've done everything Eddie and Janelle said. I've got other people running my business. So now I can take some time for me. Like all those things are negotiated. So moving on, kind of segueing into some more secrets that you need to know about business. That's, you know, why this, I think, transformation is so important is because we're basically telling you all the things that I wish I would have known before I started my business. Moving on to kind of the second point um, that I think keeps people tripped up in their business is working on your business versus working in your business. Yeah. And people work deep, deep in their business. Yep. Like, you know, you've you've probably been shopped somewhere where the owner is like deep into the work that's required to produce whatever is being produced. And a lot of things suffer. Right. Right. Customer service suffers. But most of all, like when you're working on your business, you're able to plan, you're able to strategize, you're able to do things to help you grow your business because there's only three ways to do that. And if you're not working on those one of those three ways, then your business is not going to grow. On what are the three ways? The three ways to, to grow your business is to increase customers, so mm -hmm. new customers, mm -hmm. right? Increase the frequency of existing customers, and then increasing the average transactions of your customers, right? And so those are three ways every single business that you interact with 
drives their business. They were either trying to acquire more customers, they're trying to get past customers to shop more often, or the customers they have, they're trying to get them to buy more at a given time. Right. So you can't do any of those things and focus on growth in any of those three key areas if you are the doer of all things. Yeah. And so often um, you see business owners like, you know, I took the order, I responded to the email. I Not only did I find the customer, I responded to the email. Then they start complaining because the customer has questions and they want to go back and forth with inquiries. They're upset with the customer because now that was five different emails and a mm -hmm. phone call. And they're complaining and all they're really doing is providing customer service, maybe trying to close a sale, but because you're busy doing a million other things, you can't even provide the best customer service, right. right? So if you are the doer of all things, the customer service, the department, the finance department, the product innovation department, the product fulfillment department, the shipping department, you cannot <laughs> continue at that rate. So yeah. and we always know that when we ask a business owner, like how is business going? And they're like, oh, it feels like it's going pretty, it, it felt right. like it was pretty busy, busy today. And when someone says they feel like something's busy or if something felt like it was a lot of traffic, um, what that tells you is they don't know the data, right? right? And that means that they're going based off how they felt because they were in it, right? Yep. They were making the thing. Instead of someone saying, oh yeah, yesterday, you know, and it, it, obviously you're gonna get people who say, it felt pretty busy, but when I looked at the data, this is where it was, what, what was really going on, right. right? And so that is something that's really important because you don't know when you're in the business that you're drowning, right? Right. And you think, oh God, we were so busy, how come I don't have any money in the bank? Yep, so think about this, your business can be people driven, it can be process driven, or it can be you driven. Yeah. <laughs> And I'll just tell you, when you first start your business, you are always, it's the you business. Like right. It's you driven. You are the one that has the idea. You're the one that has the vision. You're the one that is going to be excited about it. Then the next phase after that is to get to a system that's process driven, a business that's process driven with systems, right? So for example, when I was the in the business of me, I was you driven, the Cake mm -hmm. Mamas was you driven, we were making all of the things, doing all of the things, answering the emails, but every single time I responded to an email, I was creating a process for that. Here's how we greet the customers. Here's right. how we thank them for an inquiry. Here's how we offer them a pricing sheet. Here's how we um, book an order. A 50% deposit is required. And here's how you can get to from a you-driven business to a process-driven business. And that is anything in your business that you repeat that will have to be done again, you are literally documenting the process. Mm -hmm. So. If I'm making a red velvet cake from home and I have perfected a recipe, I'm going to stop, pause before I take another order and I'm going to write out the recipe and then you whip the butter and then you slowly incorporate this and then you use a scoop with an eight inch round pan and you put eight scoops in it and then you bake it for this long and then you let it chill for this long. Why am I doing that? I'm doing that so there's a process so that way now my teenage kid or my husband who's off for the weekend or my next door neighbor who's got some extra time and says she wants to help, I can actually leverage that help, right? right. And so we had processes while we were working from home so that people could come in and help. Right. And then after you go from a process-driven business, you can then go to a people-driven business because of the processes that you've put in place, because of the steps that you have taken to make sure that you know all of the things up the totem pole, um, you've thought them through, you've put a process together, and now other people can help you, and you're not the doer of all things. Yeah, and I think, so you may be thinking about, oh, okay, that's great. Or you may be thinking, well, I'm a hairdresser. It's always going to be me, mm -hmm. right? And we talked about this on, on, a, on a prior episode where we talked about the fact that like if hairdressers would, would use processes mm -hmm. and systems, yep. then it would take care of some of their back end things because yeah, a lot of it is them driven. But I also think that there are times where you can actually hire a team, right? Yep. When you have uh, you know, someone that's gonna do certain washing the hair and someone else is gonna do something else and then you step in because you are a specialist in color. What I, yep. you know, I don't know anything about Good job, doing baby. hair, but that is how my brain works. So I'm saying, thinking about 
processes mm-hmm. and, then, and then also people. Right. And, you know, I said in the previous episode about my experience at a hair salon, and I'm going to be starting like a YouTube or a TikTok series. It's like three things I would do to change the game if I were a hairstylist. Number one, I would have processes. Mm-hmm. Like I would say if someone is going to find me on Instagram and they want to be a potential client, you better believe it's going to say click the link in my bio for booking appointments right. um, with me. You better believe it's going to take you to an automated system where you're either going to give me your email address or your phone number and I'm going to generate an automatic email that goes straight to you or text message that tells you when somebody will get back to you but until then you can look at my pricing you can Mm -hmm. look at my calendar there are so many things you can do to automate right? right and so even taking a business that is you driven I think that there are ways to offload some of those responsibilities but you can never ever offload without organization and systems, yeah. right? So and no one can help you if you don't have good organization around your time. Yeah, and, and you have to think about this deeply. Like if you're not working to get to that place, just know that your business will constantly be a drainer on you, right? right? And what you, what you want is you want your business to give give you life. Like you wanna find fulfillment in it. Like you want the things that your business creates to help and enrich other people's lives. And you can feel good about that, but also it's a means to whatever your ends may be, right? If your end is to have freedom, if your end is to travel all the time, if your end is to spend more time with your family, like your business can do that for you if you're thinking about some of the concepts and the things that we're talking about in a deeper way that we're explaining them to you so that you can implement these things and say, okay, now I'm gonna transform my business. My business has been draining me, but now I'm gonna transform it, transform it to the place where it's giving me life, it's giving my customers life, it's giving the people I'm hiring and, and my employees life. Like everyone is benefiting from a business and that's what makes businesses so important. I mean, a lot of people throw shots at capitalism, but the reality is capitalism gives us the ability in a lot of cases to have so many options in life, right? And so, yeah, there are times where it goes in the wrong direction, but when you're doing it the right way, boy, does it bring so much joy and happiness and fulfillment and service to to people throughout their lives. You know what else it gives you? Freedom. Yeah. I cannot, you know, have the business of my dreams without help. Right. I cannot be in two places at once. So I can't be tending to the ba- the business, uh, the baby of my business, right? Unless, uh, and be happy doing that if I'm missing my kids' soccer games. Right. If I'm not spending quality time with my husband because I'm in grind season 24-7 for the last three years. Like I can't find any fulfillment or joy or maintain the, the relationships that, that are resentment. important. <laughs> and the yeah, I'll find resentment, but I damn sure won't be creating freedom right. if I continue to be the doer of all things, right? The next thing we want to talk to you about um, around your business transformation, and I guess these are secrets that we're trying to not make such big secrets, and that is the fact that you are probably devaluing your magic Mm. when it comes to your prices, when it comes to how you're putting yourself out there. You probably are questioning everything. It's got to be perfect, and so it's kind of convoluting the way that you show up and get your brand out there. Yeah, and and a lot of times, and this is for p- folks that have a tough time with, with acting or putting things out, because you have a magic, right? There's something that this idea came to you, this, this skill you developed, uh, and a lot of times when we develop a skill, we forget how much it's valued, right? Yep. If, if you're a computer technician, if you're a hairstylist, you do it all the time that you don't necessarily see that there's value in what you do, and so you devalue it. Um, and then I think that when you do that, then all of a sudden, which we'll talk about in this series, it affects your pricing, it affects your confidence to putting yourself out there, it impacts everything that that's going on in your business. And then before you know it, you've like you've riddled yourself with doubt Right. And so now you don't put anything out. You're not taking the risk necessary to take your business to the next level. Yeah, for sure. And I think that the other thing that you need to understand is in order to put yourself out there and take those risks, that's going to come down to one word. And that is 
really what we wind up teaching in Passion of Profit that people seem to find as the biggest benefit to the courses we offer, and that is confidence. Mm -hmm. When you have a, a sense of confidence, you're able to put your products out there, put yourself out there to market your business, to talk and spark conversations with perfect strangers. If you don't figure out a way to build confidence, then you're not going to be taking those next steps that you need to grow your business. Yeah, and I think the the thing that you have to keep in mind, and this is for so many people that we pay more reverence to what we haven't accomplished to what's possible, mm -hmm. right? Think about that. You spend more time thinking about what you haven't done than what is actually possible. And I think that that robs innovation. It takes everything away from you. So I think it's important that when you think about this concept of devaluing your magic, like like this is the major transformation you need to have. The only way you value, if you, the way you show yourself or you show your business that you value it is that you put the things that we just talked about into play, right? right? You find a way to get someone else, other people to help you do this, this work. You don't treat it like something that you can't put out there. You don't over, you're not overly cautious. Like you're willing to do things because you want this magic that you have to be spread to the world. Right. I also think we give too much reverence to the things that we don't know how to do. So I don't know how to uh, be good at numbers. I don't know right. how to price my products. I don't know how to estimate how many customers will be shopping with me. I don't know how to file corporate taxes. I mm -hmm. don't know, and there's a list of things, right? right? So the question I have for you is, yeah, there's a whole list of shit you don't know how to do because you're doing it for the first time. Yeah, what is But a what about the list of things you do know how to do that you have overcome? Right. That would be a great list to look at if you're trying to build confidence, right? So one of the key categories we see business owners kind of hide behind one of the beliefs that they have around not knowing things. Uh, I don't really know how to sell. You know, salespeople are kind of slimy. I don't really know how to not come off as, you know, pushy. I don't want to be too pushy. And I do think that that is holding you back and devaluing your magic because if you start a business, if it was a passion, if it was just, you know, something you were good at, great. You decided to turn it into a business. Guess what? In order for your business to stay in business, you have to make money. There yeah. is no mission that's sustainable in your business without money. Yeah, and before your customers can have confidence in your products, you gotta have confidence in right. it. And I can tell you that there are a lot of times that we go and we to a conference and we ask someone and they're like, oh, I have a little business. Oh, and all of a sudden, Janelle uses this term all the time, people are making themselves small. Right. Right. And businesses, it's important that you know that like, in order for you to like feel like a, a real company, you gotta act like a yes. big company. Like you gotta hold act your like a chin freaking high, corporation. chest high. And you guys say, yeah, I have a business and you wanna know everything about it, right? Right, yep. <laughs> So that kind of concludes today's session, right? We right. have two more sessions that are gonna accompany this, so please continue to listen. If you got anything from this, we wanna hear from you. You have two ways of providing feedback to us. One, if you're listening to the podcast or watching this on YouTube, you can leave a comment and let us know what key things you pulled out. What did you learn from it? What will you do to implement some new strategies? Uh, just any aha moments that you had. And the next thing is you can text us. You can text us your feedback. You can text us a thank you. You can text us a hell yeah, whatever it is. You can send that to 626-469-4408. And all you have to do is text the word transform and we will make sure that we get that message and we respond back to you because we just want to make sure that this is helpful information that's going to help you move forward in your business. Fantastic. I love it. So we will see you in the next session where we will continue to help you transform your business or your business idea. Be sure to share this with a friend and we will see you in the next episode. Bye, guys. Push through.